Gentlemen, I'm going to start my timer here in the studio. Um, hello and welcome to everyone. Really excited to be here at Start Out Summit. Um, my name is Ace Callwood. I'll be the moderator for this session. And today's conversation is focused on the business case for DEI, how diversity increases business performance, which is a mouthful of a title. And uh, as some of the panelists and I have had conversation, um, part of our convo is Ought we be making a DEI case um, or a case, a business case for DEI? Is that even the right conversation to have? So over the next 40, maybe 45 minutes, we'll unpack that. Um, a tiny bit about me, I am a professional facilitator and moderator at a small firm in Richmond, Virginia called the Envoy Portfolio. Uh, in a past life, I've been a founder. I've started a couple venture-backed companies, some focused on productivity, some focused on HR. Um, and I'm an entrepreneurial educator here in town. Um, so I think and talk about innovation, entrepreneurship, but it's often kind of focused on how we interact with each other in order to get great work done. So um, I'll put my DEI hat on, which I, I do a fair amount of facilitation in as well, and start us off with a couple housekeeping pieces. Um, let me make sure I've got my notes in front of me. So as, um, as audience members, if you stay on mute, be rad. Um, make sure we're not getting any background noise from dogs or kids, et cetera, running around. We encourage your dogs and kids to sit in, uh, but as we have a conversation, uh, it'd be great if we didn't hear them the entirety of our time together. Second, just a baseline ground rule. As I share rules in my DEI facilitation, uh, I often reference Aretha Franklin. And so we uh, like to throw out RESPCT as a framework or a way to engage. We may not agree with everyone's opinion, um, but as audience members and of course panelists, um, I'd like to approach every bit of our conversation with respect. Um, for the audience, if you have questions, thoughts, throw your hand up. We'll get through the first 20, maybe 30 minutes of conversation and then go to Q&A. Um, if there is no Q&A, we will go back into questions, but I'd imagine you'll have thoughts on how this combo pertains to your organization. Um, similarly, um, if you raise your hand while we're in Q&A, we can get you that way as far as grabbing your questions. And then we'll be heading back to the main session at 1.14, 1.15 Eastern. So with that, we've got a couple incredible panelists with us, um, and I'm going to let them take a minute or two to introduce themselves. I'm going to start with Lily Zhang, who is in front of me on camera, or on my screen at least. So we'll start with Lily, and uh, would love a quick intro. Who are you? Why are you here? Um, and what do you expect to, to add to the combo? Yeah. Hey, folks. I'm Lily. Um, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. I am a solo DEI strategist and consultant based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm an author and writer. I write for the Harvard Business Review. I uh, just published an article today uh, for Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to be adding my thoughts. Um, I do a lot of work with corporate leaders um, especially in the strategy space. And so uh, if, if you follow my writing on LinkedIn, I have very strong opinions on the business case for DEI, and uh, I'm probably going to be vocal about them today. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, stirring the pot, um, pushing us forward, and having a rad conversation with all the leaders and folks here. Awesome, Lily. Thank you. Looking forward to your insight. I'm going to pop to Fenimore Fisher from uh, DLA Piper. Fenimore, quick intro for us. Who are you? Why are you here? Great. Great. Thank you, Ace. Uh, first and foremost, I'm an open a black gay male who has dedicated more than 20 years of my professional life to advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to thank uh, Start Out uh, for hosting this conference and a bit about uh, just the uh, organization that I represent. Uh, again, I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for DLA Piper. We're a multinational law firm with offices uh, in more than 40 countries uh, across the world. We're also a sponsor of the Start Out Growth Lab based in San Francisco. I, like Lily, also have very definitive views concerning the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and look forward to a great conversation. Great, Fenimore, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, to pop over to Stephanie Lampkin, 
from Blendor, who I've had the pleasure of interacting with over the years in kind of the HR space. Stephanie, welcome and uh, give us a quick intro. Hey, can everyone hear me? We can. Um, my name is Stephanie Lampkin. I'm the CEO and founder of a startup called Blendor. We are AI and people to mitigate unconscious bias in hiring, uh, but we'll actually be pivoting soon, not public yet but um, focusing on ways to use data to increase more transparency and accountability for companies like DLA Piper um, that have made really big and bold statements about their commitments to uh, ra social justice and racial equity. I am the uh, descendant of American slaves, um, so there are a lot of implications that that has had on my life, but was fortunate to get technology navigate through tech um, such that I have been able to identify some of the inefficiencies in the talent marketplace um, that inhibit historically underrepresented groups from being given equal opportunities. Great. Welcome, Stephanie. Good to see your face. It's been entirely too long. Um, and that leaves, last but not least, Julia Shaughnessy from Amazon Web Services. Julie, welcome. Give us a quick background on who you are. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been at AWS for a little over three and a half years now. I lead our operations and strategy team within the startup segment at AWS. So I get to work with a bunch of former founders, co-founders, and VCs every day. I feel super fortunate to be around all of them. Um, I'll say that while there's operations uh, in my title, there's, there's um, a very heavy lift around team morale and culture, and that's working uh, very, very closely with our um, with our IND partner uh, at AWS. So um, I have a great passion for it. Um, I live in New York City with my wife, uh, and I'm very happy to be with all of you today. Great. Thank you so much. So again, we've got uh, just an incredible group of folks here to have a conversation today. Um, so I want to kick off actually not in making the business case. We'll get there very shortly. Um, kind of what I framed for the panelists is, um, are there anecdotes and, and personal experiences within your organization? Uh, you know, Lily, I know you run a solo shop. And so uh, within some of the organizations or just the general world, are there some anecdotes as we've got a panel of minorities um, that stand out to you that start to frame why we should even be talking about DEI? I, I'd love to start there and I'm going to go to Stephanie who doesn't know I'm going to ask this, but putting her on the spot. Um, you know, I know you've spent time in, in academia and in higher ed and some prestigious institutions. What, are, what has that been like for you as a black woman? Um, talk to me about that experience and that'll, again, help to start frame where we head with the conversation. Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, I am African-American. I'm from the D.C. area, um, single parent home. My mom was actually homeless for a bit while pregnant with me. Uh, I got into tech because I had an aunt who was a computer science major in 1984, and that led me down a path to get into Stanford. And I was very intentional about choosing Stanford because they led with diversity at the time. The president um, came out and made a statement when the UC public schools were removing race as a consideration in college applications. President Hennessy stepped forward and said, we're going to take this seriously because we feel like our campus should reflect the country. Um, so my incoming class was 11 percent African-American. A couple classes later, we got Jadena and Issa Rae, which many of you know. Um, and Stanford did a really good job of building a bridge from my community to a community where the majority of people were from wealthy populations. And so in my career through Glendor, I've tried to enable other organizations to follow the same path, uh, particularly because it's not just about representation. It takes a, a large holistic effort uh, in order to enable individuals who really haven't been given a seat at the table. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I want to pop to Fenimore to, to follow up on that. I, as you started, identified as a gay black man um, in a global law firm. Talk to me about that experience and, and some of the, the good, perhaps some of the bad um, that has come out of um, that, those identities in an organization that one might feel um, is, is counter to that. Yeah, I would say that, um, and this is following along the uh, most recent comments of a phenomenal woman 
Uh, I have often been the first uh, in a series of titles and the only in the room, but that doesn't mean that I will be the last. And I think that when you look at what role as an individual you have to play when you're in organizations where you're one of a few, the most significant role that you have to play and the uh, I think the way that you have to drive your actions is with a level of tenacity and authenticity. And I think that if you don't stay true to who you are in these settings, then you not only do a disservice to yourself, but you do a disservice to all of the individuals who are seeking to follow in your path or who may already be in your path, but who may be masking in the workplace. And so I, th I, I think each step that I take to show not only as you know, someone in the chief diversity and inclusion officer role, certainly there's an expectation that they have to be an advocate, but I think that you also have to be one that serves as a a uh, platform and a vehicle for candid direct dialogue as well as intentional action uh, and, and within a global law firm and, and big law in particular has had I think um, a uh, an aspect culturally of being uh, in a sense um, uh, uh, not necessarily um, showing a culture that has been one that has driven a broadening of its culture, but more so an assimilation into an existing culture. And, and for me, I think that's another way that you have to then drive change is by creating something that that drives structural change and really impacting the culture. Great, great. So I'm, I'm hearing being a catalyst for, as you just framed structural change, and, and as you are the first of a title and often the only in the room, um, the, the idea that you won't be the last, and that's important, and we've got to build a foundation so folks aren't covering uh, or masking as you framed it in the organization. That, that's critical. Um, I want to pop to Julie. Uh, as as a woman in a massive tech firm, and you know, there's been quite the conversation over the last several years about the culture of of tech. Talk to me about your experiences, particularly in uh, uh, you know a STEM type role. Thinking about data, what has that been like? Yeah, and Ace, the one thing I I didn't mention before uh, before AWS, my my former life was investment banking, uh, right. so arguably. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll say it's been um, a more positive transition from the investment banking world into a company like AWS, but we've got a lot of work to do, um, a lot. And we at AWS, so data focused, and you'll, you'll hear innovation constantly, right? And show me the data, show me the data. And when it comes to DE&I, it's the way that we've been talking about it as a leadership team. The data is a lagging indicator of what's not happening around the leadership table. So why are decisions being made by the six white men in the room? How do you make that change? The data is going to be an output of what you peel back. So for us, we've been trying to change the conversation of show me the data, show me the data to being intentional and having really challenging conversations. Um, and there's a lot that needs to, to change from the top down. Um, so I would say um, right now, you know, we're we're making some intentional changes to the way we're structured, um, like not having DE and I roll into HR into that function, but having it sit within the business, being a part of the customer um, experience, understanding what our customers are asking for. Um, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer of we can't accurately, appropriately serve our customers and help them achieve our goals until we become better internally. Um, and that's that's the focus right now heading into 2021. 
Great, great. Julia, I, I love that piece about moving DEI out of HR and into uh, the business. And then, you know, noting that we talk so much about data and being data driven and, and running on data, but the reality is the data is biased, right? If we think about a computer, garbage in, garbage out. Um, if we have had a ton of inequity in our organization, the data uh, that, that results from that is going to be skewed toward whatever bias um, you know, helped to create the data in the first place. So that, that's spot on. I love that. Um, I want to roll to Lily as, as the probably last question that I will just go down the line to all four panelists. We'll go, we'll get into the Wild West here shortly, a free for all, if you will. Uh, but Lily, you know, I, we talked a little bit about how you are your own shop and work with organizations. So perhaps some anecdotes uh, about your experience walking into or looking at some of the organizations, some of the writing, some of the feedback um, from from your lens. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's really weird. Um, <laughs> so I I got my start because I was really tired of being the only the the only blank in the room, and I figured I should get paid for it. So now I'm the only blank in a room full of white men, and they pay me to be there. And and what that means for me, um, frankly, it's just a lot of code switching. Um, I, I need to be able to navigate spaces with only six white men, or or is more typically the case these days, five white men and one white woman that is trying to pretend like she's not there, um, and go from those spaces to talking to employees that are overwhelmingly, you know, much more diverse, that are people of color, that are disabled, that are queer and trans, and I need to be the bridge between these folks, and and it's a it's a really sort of uncanny valley place to be to be very frank, right? Like when I work with these leaders, um, <laughs> they are they are simultaneously scared of me, uh, respect me, want me there, and don't want me there. And so <laughs> as a consultant, you know, it's, it's just always something that I have to navigate. How can I hold them accountable? How can I cut through the bullshit while not scaring them so much that they don't want to do the work? And that's, that's, question that you know I've had and, and that many minorities have had to navigate their entire lives I, I just happened to make my career around it um, but that's that's the daily experience right how do you work with folks who have power to convince them to let go of power or to make systems more equitable or to make their companies less shitty without scaring them so much that they flip the table and fire you on the spot and and it's tough it's it's honestly tough. Uh, so so I'll I'll just share that. Um, that's that's a that's a little snapshot of day in day out for me. Um, and and I I go through this all the time on on LinkedIn, um, where I make posts going like we should listen to white men, and then the next post that I make is just like okay, sometimes white men are kind of a lot, and then I get comments that are just like, but you just <laughs> said we should listen to white men. Why are you saying we're a lot? And I'm like nuance is important, and sometimes. You're full of shit. Yep. And that's the, the, the internet where nuance goes to die. Um, I, <laughs> I feel that in a real way. Um, so, I, I mean, I, the note that I took is our job is to make companies less shitty. And uh, apparently Britt noted the same thing in the, the chat. So um, for those in the audience, the chat is a great way to make sure I'm keeping up with your sentiment. Um, I, Lily, you've got quite the fan club as uh, folks follow your writing. Stephanie, um, you've got a, a supporter in the audience as well, like in some of your posts or your points. Um, and I'm getting a recap in real time from some folks in the audience as well. So uh, keep the engagement up there. If you've got questions, start to drop them and I'll make sure we get to them here in a couple minutes. So I want to I want to shift and actually, Lily, I'm going to I'm going to stick with you for this one. Um, I want to shift to the business case for DEI and frame that ever so slightly. Um, I, I wrote a piece um, just after George Floyd was killed um, called the, the Burden of Finally Being Seen. Um, and it got picked up and shared and all that good stuff. But the, the general premise was um, it, it sucks to not be seen, to be overlooked, to be this, you know, uh, historically overlooked and underserved 
um, person. Uh, it also sucks to be seen when people say, oh, my God, we've been doing it wrong. Tell us how to help. Um, so we're, we're now burdened, if you will, and that's a word that I'll, I'll use over the course of our time together. We're burdened with this idea that we ought to make the case for DEI and the, the business case and drive to the bottom line because that's what people care about. Um, give me your reflection on that. I know we had a, a mini convo prior to this one. Um, ought we be making the business case in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for the audience, uh, just some background, I emailed a and was just like, just an FYI, I hate the business case and I'm here to like set it on fire. So apologies in advance. Um, so so that's that's the context. Um, so, you know, to, to, to be very frank, I, I don't believe in it. We've been using the business case for diversity in the DEI field for literally 50 years. Like this, this isn't a new thing. And we can see firsthand the progress that it's made when when you approach leaders and you tell them that the only reason you should care about people of color and women is that it'll make them more money right like what you are doing is you are you are fundamentally cheapening the value of diversity to corporations and and like i'm i i think about for example the the uh the the dirty 12 companies that have made enormous amounts of money during covid um, when I think about the business case, for example, and they've done so by just cutting their costs and shortchanging workers and treating people like garbage, right? Like that is the fundamental end result if we focus on these business case arguments. Like at the end of the day, you know, if if we just say profit matters over everything, let's play that game and and frame the value of a person of color in terms of dollars per year, we we've already lost. We've, we've already lost before we've entered the conversation, right? And I can crunch numbers. I'm, I'm happy to go to executives and be like, guess what? If you add 10 more people of color, your company is going to get 5% uh, more creative. And they'll be like, okay, that's great. Our company's fine. So thanks for that. And I'm going to put, put your report on the shelf and never look at it again. All right? People just aren't motivated by that stuff. Oh my God, Aloha, stop sharing my article in the chat. That's embarrassing. <laughs> but yes, I did write an article about this. Um, so, so like that's kind of where I stand. I feel like if we're going to have a real conversation about the business case for diversity, we need to stop doing this like really piecemeal, really straightforward, like X diversity equals Y more money and start talking about like, why is it we're doing this work? How is it we can actually reach leaders? Because if we're actually looking at impact, the business case doesn't actually impact leaders very much. Uh, the, the, the leaders that cite the business case already cared about diversity before you gave the business case to them, right? The business case doesn't convince people, it just gives them an excuse to act. So what do we actually do to shift leaders' behaviors? How can we actually get companies to move in the direction we're trying to get them to move? And then once we figure out that motivation, our communication strategy, that's all icing on the cake, right? We can use the business case to talk about stuff. Sure, that's fine, that's great. The fundamental motivator for this work, I think the business case is dead. I, I think we just need to stop like beating this dead horse and like move on to, to talk about like impact driven work, to talk about work that resonates with communities, to talk about social impact. Like this is the stuff that's more important, honestly. Great, great. Well, that, that I think that just wraps us up. We're good. Our work here is stop done. Stop it. Get out. Uh, no, everybody, uh, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at Lily's article. It is it, it is a very good one um, and, and outlines a lot of what was just shared. I want to pop to Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, again, you and I know each other from the, the tech and entrepreneurship world. And, and I know Blendor, I think you beat me in a competition once um, <laughs> with an incredible pitch. You know, a big piece of your pitch is making the case to organizations that they ought to adopt a piece of technology to drive diversity and ultimately increase and improve not only the culture, but the bottom line. So in some respects, your pitch is for or around the business case for diversity. I'd love to, for you to, to reflect a bit on Lily's sentiment and then share a little bit about how you think about framing Blendor as an opportunity, but maybe not just driving to the bottom line. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, the pitch has changed a little bit since I, I, I beat you a few years ago, Ace. You didn't Let's have to say that. Over that, by the way. Actually, I don't think I beat you. We tied. Anyway, um, so similar to Lily, I do believe the business case is bullshit, but I also believe that if we don't recognize that the sole uh, priority 
of a company is to maximize shareholder value, then not appealing to the business case will not get us any closer to our end goal. So when I said that our pitch has changed, it's changed from focusing on how diverse teams perform better, diverse companies achieve 35% higher ROI, to if you don't do this, not only will it reflect poorly on your brand as a company that you are selling products and services to people and that's not reflected in your leadership, but also it puts you at a much greater risk for a major fuck up and fuck ups are expensive. Uh, Starbucks spent like $10 million in shutting down their stores for a day and giving people unconscious bias training. So I've had to shift the conversation about the business case from less of a carrot and more to the stick. And that's what resonates with senior leadership teams. And that's kind of around the pivot that we're doing as well, because I'm a bit fed up and I'm at the point where it's like, OK, you can do this or not, but I guarantee you I'm going to put your laundry out for everybody to see. <laughs> Love it. Fuck ups are expensive is what I heard. That's not the only thing I heard, but I like that one. Um, no, that's a you know, we have to make the business case, given that the focus is on increasing share value it's this interesting thing and Lily you mentioned this right like we we equate uh, dollars to human capital people right um, and you know that goes all the way back to chattel slavery is money for humans and so as we as we try to c disconnect the two you know business and the culture of business has to catch up in order for us to be able to properly stop making the case for diversity which is important Fenimore I want to I want to pop to you now um, and then, uh, Julie, we're going to head in a slightly different direction, talking about the data that drives culture. But Fenimore, to wrap this one up, um, DLA Piper has clearly made a commitment in, in having a CDO um, and, and appointing you to that role. Um, there is at least some buy-in at DLA Piper. Can you talk to why that, that decision was made and, and how that is driving your work? Um, is not only the salary that they pay and the resources they give you, uh, but the cultural shifts that you're you're working to make within the firm. Sure. Uh, the firm had had for quite some time a, a long-standing diversity and inclusion office and multiple programs and initiatives, but not a specific strategy, as well as a platform. Um, and this is to Stephanie's point of measuring progress and driving accountability. And the only reason or the primary reason why I um, accepted the opportunity is that I saw a commitment from Roger Meltzer, uh, who is the global co-chair uh, as well as the co-chair for the Americas. And I said up front, Look, I'm not the type of CDIO who is the rah-rah, put me up front, let's make some nice announcements and let's get some awards. Um, that's, I, I, that's just not been my work over 20 plus years. And, and so I, I feel at DLA Piper, we have more than buy-in because we've got an accountability structure. So all of our practice group leaders have DNI dashboards, which I review with them on a quarterly basis. We have established KPIs where we review new hires, promotions, attrition, as well as uh, lawyer production and pace. Each of our practice group leaders have to establish annually diversity and inclusion action plans. And Stephanie, you mentioned um, our um, public statement concerning underscoring our commitment to racial equity and social justice. And we are a member of the law firm Alliance Against Racism. And, and what is key and critical is that, look, if we don't take this time to make this not just a, a, a moment, but a movement, as often has been said, then we are missing an opportunity to not only impact the legal profession, but society as a whole. Uh, and so what I think is also driven by, and, and this goes to the business case, is that we have uh, our client population also too, that's seeking to have an impact. Stephanie, you mentioned the primary focus of 
is being increasing value. I think what is interesting is that last summer, the uh, uh, business roundtable issued a revised statement concerning what's the purpose of corporations, and they added a focus on community. They added a focus on uh, uh, providing support to talent, to human capital, and they added a focus on supplier diversity, which I think is should be impactful for startup. Our job, though, and our role is to then drive accountability and it's to establish metrics and measurements. So, and Lily, I agree with you. I've Look, since 1997, when I was a law student intern for the Rainbow Push Coalition, we've been talking about the business case. I'm that language. I almost didn't accept this invitation because of the, 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 of the title. Same here. Um, but, but, I, but I will say that what is should be the definitive statement is that you have to move forward with this work or you will be left behind and you won't be able to sustain from an aspect of growth, innovation, and market penetration where you need to be to have a sustainable business. Senator Moore, I'm capturing that last note. Um, you have to move forward with this work or you'll be left behind. Um, you know, as simply put, I think that is the case, business or otherwise, um, from a sustainability standpoint, if you care to exist, um, irrespective of the bottom line, if you care to keep the lights on, you've got to make sure you've got a representative community within your organization. Sounds like you're doing a ton of that work at DLA Piper, and that that is that is encouraging um, to know that we continue to see more and more leaders pop up to do that. Um, one of the things you noted is is around KPIs and business units having to put those metrics up um, and and hold to them. Um, so I want to I want to move to Julie. Um, and Julie, I'm not going to pigeonhole you as the uh, the data woman, uh, but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about how we look at the data and how that can help inform the decisions we need to make, uh, particularly on the heels of Fenimore's comment about uh, understanding the number of hires, how, how many candidates we have who come in, um, and what the diversity uh, therein looks like. Talk to me about how, the, how we can leverage the data to continue moving these initiatives forward. Yeah, data lady kind of goes hand in hand with the ops piece of my my title, so it's fair, yep. fair game. Um, yeah, so here here's the thing with with data, and and I was listening to to Fenimore talk, and um, the problem with the data, at least in my experience in both AWS and um, prior investment banks, is that it's only shared at a certain level, and that creates a problem around transparency and communication across our entire organization. Um, you know, my colleagues who want to feel more comfortable and happy in an environment where we are trying to progress to a more inclusive culture. And it's difficult. Um, there's the challenge around the policy aspect from an, from an HR um, perspective and how can you effectively communicate where we are with our goals and KPIs um, around this. And we are even um, coached to, to not really say we've got goals around DE and I. Like it I, I it's it's a struggle. I think it's it's a struggle for um, business leaders. It's a struggle for folks in my position who are typically the conduits of um, getting this communication and transparency across. Um, and we're finding it to be a really big challenge. And there's a bunch of feedback. Um, and I talked to colleagues around um, other companies, other larger companies dealing with the same um, issue. So um, we have data to some regard, but then there's the data that we're lacking. As an LGBTQ woman, um, we don't openly track that due to um, many things, right, due to um, it not being legal in in a lot of countries around the globe more global organization um so there are some pretty big obstacles uh that we need to overcome um and one of them really biggest in my camp is how can we be more transparent to make our colleagues that we work with day in day out aware of the work we are pushing forward um and i'll say it too like 
away a little away from from data you, you know we track number of programs we launch in this space um this being one of them aws partnership with start out huge win that's great but should we really be focused on the count goals like that rather than coaching our leaders to start hiring retaining promoting um, within the organization so i think there's a challenge in in focus and priorities as well yeah so i want to and thank you for that julie i'm, I'm going to take that thread and get into q a with a couple minutes left um, but what I what I'll actually do is take the commentary and bundle that into a question I'd love reflection on. So we've got a couple of things. It's really hard to make a case to numbers oriented and data oriented folks if it's not data oriented. Um, I've got a comment that uh, you know the the path of least resistance tends not to be. Um, with the business leaders or the CEOs and I saw somebody kind of frame that as. Uh, cis hetero white males, which is often the case, um, and that the traction is with ERG leads. Um, so what I'd like to pose is if we're not making the business case or we feel like we ought not make that case, how do we circumnavigate the folks who need the business case made to them and find the folks who actually care and can enact change? Where as a panel are we finding those folks and, and how do we track them down and make the right case, not the business case. And and that's a free for all. Anybody uh, anybody want to step up and take a crack? I have a thought on this. Um, right. So really? so I think, first of all, um, the question here is really about power and influence, right? How how can we reach people in positions of power, whether they're ERG leads or, or business leaders? I feel like usually they're business leaders and not ERG leads, to be very honest. Um, ERG leads are usually underpaid, under-resourced, overworked, and over-committed. Uh, and unfortunately, I wish it were different. They don't have much power within the organizations where they work out. That being said, I think the numbers question is, is really interesting, and that's one that I spend a lot of time working on. I find that when there are people that see no problem with the status quo, before you make any change, you need them to have a problem with the status quo. That is an absolute prerequisite. And I think that's where data can really be useful, though this, this gets to Julie's conversation on what data can we collect. Um, I've, I've had so many conversations with like data scientists within companies that, uh, similar to you, Julie, say things like, we, we have our hands tied, we can't collect this demographic information, so we don't know how well we're doing. Everyone feels like we're not doing well, but it's a chicken and egg problem. And so what I do when I, when I hit those situations is I say, you know, this is one, this is a matter of trust. And two, this is a matter of like within the organization, you don't have the infrastructure you need to be able to diagnose your problem. So I, I typically insert myself in as a consultant and say, what if I was the only one who looked at this data? What if I was the only one that reviewed demographics? And so no one within the organization did it. And so there was very little chance of retaliation. And then that's, that's like a weird Band-Aid solution that gets around some of that problem, Julie. But like, Again, like I'm, I'm going to be very honest and say, like this is a huge open challenge within our field because trust and the lack of it is the root cause of all of these issues that we're facing. If people don't trust their organization, they don't trust their organizational leaders. Why would they share their demographic information, right? If if they don't trust that their organization is going to make change, why would they be vulnerable to their leaders? And then when we talk to leaders that don't understand that there's a problem. We need to understand that this isn't about incentivizing them to to suddenly give a damn. It's about diagnosing all the reasons why the people that are suffering within that organization don't feel empowered to give that feedback, right? That that very, very first step. How can we fix that? And when we rebuild trust, when we rebuild people's faith in leaders, then we can start at the starting line. But I see so many people having the conversation about like different conversational tactics to convince leaders to start giving a damn. And I think that's skipping ahead, right? We need to figure out why everyone's pissed, why no one's happy, why people of color are disenfranchised and like start 
repairing some of the harm that's been done in the past because I guarantee you every organization that's going on their DEI journey right now has a really dirty legacy of harm that they've done in the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And the people that have experienced that harm, are some of them are probably still there. They're still pissed and they're not going to believe in any positive thing that goes forward until you fix that, right? And so I, I think that's where we need to be starting. I love it. Thank you, Lily. The, the note that I pulled out is you need people to have a problem with the status quo before you get them on a, to a place where they're willing to change it. Um, how do we better inform that is a, is a, is a big piece um, and the power and influence therein. It, it feels like this zero sum game. And I think we're seeing that politically across the country. If, if one group is getting it feels like another group is losing something. Um, one could also argue that the only thing being lost is the ability to infringe on a group's rights. Uh, but, you know, that's that's my commentary for the day before I put hey, my foot in my mouth. Um, Fenimore, I want to... Yeah. I, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like to contribute to the to the last question, just um, uh, borrowing... Absolutely. I've got another one for you as well. So carry on. So I'd, I'd like to start uh, with uh, Julie's uh, reference of the tension point concerning data. Look, historically throughout my career, I have heard across multiple sectors, I've heard uh, this pushback concerning, well, we don't want to establish illegal hiring quotas, or we don't want to run the risk of uh, having a potential for a reverse discrimination lawsuit. That needs to be balanced with equal pushback saying, well, what's the greater risk? Is that the, when you look at not addressing people who have been historically underutilized and you look at not addressing the structural and institutional barriers to entry that have served as hindrances to having a more inclusive workplace, the greater risk always is in not addressing that aspect of systemic racism. And so as I've tried to be a tenacious advocate throughout my life in my career, I have I have often communicated that sometimes, Julie, I win <laughs> and sometimes I, I lose. But I think the, the the key aspect that gets missing that's missing from that discussion is that component. And then um, concerning the comments about moving on from individuals who, who simply just don't get it. I, I, I guess I try to stay an internal um, optimist in this space uh, because I think when you are doing this work, you've got to approach it from the head, which is specific to the metrics. You've got to approach it from the heart and from the hands in terms of directly touching people. And what I have seen that has been a, a somewhat it's inspiring is that all of the um, horrific things that we have experienced in 2020, especially in, including the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and so many others, it has sparked this focus on people asking, I want to be an ally. You know, people I've never heard from before. I want to be an ally. What, what do I do? How, does I, how do I drive some sort of effective, meaningful impact? And then that's when I, 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 I think it's important to focus on, OK, are you looking at the diversity of the candidate slates that are applying for positions or being considered for positions on your teams? And if you are, then are you pausing on your searches if you aren't then securing an inclusive slate? Now, we at DLA Piper, we apply a 30% threshold to our candidate slate, which does provide some uh, great assistance and measurement, but that's also, I think, at times, um, you have to have a focus from both the head, but also the heart. And I think this is a time where people are trying to understand who haven't historically been supporters and advocates, what they do, what should they do? Uh, and so I just wanted to add to that that portion of the commentary of the dialogue. No, thank you so much. And Fenimore, that is going to close us out uh, for today. We are right at time and that time flew. Um, so for those who had questions, um, if the panelists will drop an easy way to get in touch in the public sphere, not necessarily your email, but a handle, et cetera, um, feel free to do that. 
And then um, everybody can be tracked down on the interwebs. I'm sure I've connected with a couple folks already. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, you've got a link in the uh, chat from Melissa back to the main session, and we will see you there for the next bit of content. Uh, and I'll be on for a quick recap of this session in the main session. So thanks again. And to the panelists, much appreciated for joining the lively discussion. Thank you all.